Chapter 21 Over the weeks, as I learned more about American history, I started to understand more about what it meant to be African American and the ongoing and complex fight for equality. But I was still very confused. I noticed that on TV, it seemed as if black people were always committing crimes. In fact, it seemed like black people were solely responsible for crime in America. On news shows and fictional shows alike, it was a constant parade of black people getting arrested and thrown in jail. The images were so negative. I was sort of scared of being black. Those images did not represent me or the black girls I was meeting at school. I wondered if black people in America were mostly bad. I thought that perhaps I needed to prove to white people that I wasn't like the criminals I saw on TV. It made me question so many things. I started doing my own research and talking to the African-American girls at school, engaging in conversations with them at lunch. The black girls were on top of any news stories involving race and discrimination, such as controversial police shootings. And they also discussed the kinds of everyday hurdles that black people face in America. I was impressed by their knowledge. There were three girls in particular who always had insightful things to say. Taryn, Sideris, and Taylor. My white friends, Leah and Mackenzie, listened intently to the discussions. They were such good listeners. They were learning with me. I began to gain a deeper understanding of the complexities of race in America. I learned that the way black people were portrayed on TV certainly did not reflect the much more nuanced and complicated reality. I learned about tensions between black people and the police. I learned how black parents would warn their kids to be careful around officers because a black kid could get shot for simply running down the street. I learned how black parents would advise their kids to keep their driver's license somewhere accessible so they wouldn't have to dig deep for it, lest the cops think they were reaching for a gun. I also noticed that the white girls in school seemed afraid of the black girls, worried that they would get beaten up if they crossed them. But the black girls were the sweetest, smartest, nerdiest kids. They could never beat anyone up. Still, there was a perception that they were scary or dangerous. And one day, I had my own experience of being perceived as bad, simply because I was black. I was shopping in the Banana Republic at the mall with my friend Leah, and a clerk was following us around the store, keeping an eye on us. Finally, the clerk told us, there's nothing here for you. Okay, I said, and we left, embarrassed and confused. Perhaps the clerk thought we had no money because we were teenagers, but I had seen other teens in the store, and they hadn't been asked to leave. Outside the store, Leah, who is white, was fuming. You realize what just happened, right? She thinks you're going to shoplift because you're black, she said. That thought hadn't even occurred to me. What do you mean? I asked. I was dressed nicely, as always. I looked like a teen girl. I did not look like a criminal, but I was black. I'll never forget that moment. And incidentally, the store clerk totally blew it. Leah's dad had given her money for the shopping trip. We were ready to spend it. On that day, I realized it didn't matter how I saw myself because other people saw my skin color. Before I came to America, I was Sandra. I was a student, a daughter, a sister. I was African, Congolese. Did I ever define myself as black? No, my skin color didn't determine who I was as a person. Everyone was black. My interests, my beliefs defined me. My skin color was simply a fact about me like the fact that I like candy. If you ask who I am as a person, I wouldn't say, I like candy. That's not a fundamental thing that describes me. But in America, my skin color did define me, at least in other people's eyes. I was black. I was black first, and then I was Sandra. I had grown up in a war zone, but life in America, I realized was a different kind of war zone. I began talking to my parents about what I was learning from my African-American friends at school. Mom and dad had seen all the negative portrayals of black people on TV. They weren't meeting a lot of different people like I was. They were working hard, dealing with their issues. Mom continued to be the breadwinner, 
working in the factory while my dad recuperated from his injuries. It was still hard for me to accept the fact that my larger-than-life parents seemed so small in America, so under the radar. Mom took a second job cleaning a movie theater, and I helped her on the weekends. The movie theater was awful. I could not understand why people would buy giant buckets of popcorn, only to dump them on the floor. We had to clean the theater overnight after the last show, so the place would be ready for moviegoers the next day. I would go to the theater around 10.30 at night with mom and my cousin Claudine. We would wait for the last show to end, usually around midnight, and then sweep and mop the floors and scour the bathrooms. People left the toilets in such a mess. They never stopped to think about the fact that someone else had to clean up after them. The unseen people like us at night. It took hours to clean that grimy theater as there were several screening rooms and we would generally finish around six in the morning. If there had been a big premiere the night before with a lot of people attending and throwing things on the floor, we would be there until eight in the morning. My mom did this several nights a week from Sunday to Thursday after working all day at the factory. It was a physically demanding job, reaching under the seats in the theater to scrape up goo, scrubbing toilets in the bathroom. By the end of the night, I often felt like my body would give out. But mom would do that back-breaking job and then go straight to work at the factory the next morning. She did all of this without complaining. She did her work with such grace and resilience, never a gripe. Watching her inspired me to do well in school so I could help her financially one day and she wouldn't have to work so hard. But I had my bratty moments too. I still had to help my parents translate the bills and other documents at home, which got on my nerves. One time I tried to explain the cable TV bill to my mom when she thought she was overcharged. She was impatient. Call them. Tell them they're charging too much, she said. I called the cable company and someone there explained the bill. It turned out we were not being overcharged. I tried to explain it to mom, but she wasn't buying it. Why are you being so nice to them? She asked. This is money. Then she got on the phone and spoke in broken English saying, I know pay, I know pay. I wanted no part of that. Sometimes I would have to make phone calls pretending to be my mom. I would call the home insurers, the credit card companies. If someone asked me something I didn't know, I would have to say, hold on a second, and then I would ask mom for the information. I always had to know my parents' passwords for email and other accounts in case of any problems. I'm sure it pained my parents to have to ask their kids for help. It must have been hard for them, but I didn't realize that at the time. Back home in Congo, my parents understood everything and they taught me. Now it was the other way around. I taught them. Every time they asked me to translate a bill, I'd groan about it. I hated the fact that I couldn't be a normal kid, like the kids around me. Their parents were in charge, and they understood how things worked. My friend's parents drove them everywhere, while my own family didn't have a car. My friends got allowances from their parents, a concept I had never heard of. I was leading a double life, trying to be an American kid at school, but coming home to teach my parents English and help them pay the bills. Kids aren't supposed to teach their parents. Essentially, everything my parents knew about American culture came from me, but I still knew so little myself. Adding to the cultural divide, my fellow students were pretty well off. They'd say things like, I need to get good grades or I won't get a car for my 16th birthday. Really? Your own new car? For your birthday? I didn't even have a cell phone, which of course made me the biggest dork around. Dad tried to do everything he could to help mom and the rest of us around the house, like getting up early each day to make breakfast for everyone. That would ordinarily be considered women's work in my culture, and some men would never do it, no matter the circumstances. They would expect the women to do everything, My dad is different from so many men in my culture. Sometimes he would tell us how his property would be divided among all of his kids if he passed away. Not just given to the boys, per the tradition. Another example of his awesome feminism. But I would soon test his limits.